Has anyone really expected a revival of Crash Bandicoot? After the orange marsupial was dormant for roughly 9 years, he finally found resurgence in the Fantastic and Sane trilogy for the PlayStation 4. I'm just glad this exists! We live in the year 2017 and we got a legitimately good Crash Bandicoot game! I love the Insane Trilogy so much, I need to quench my hunger for more Crash Bandicoot goodness. But the only way I could truly enjoy the classic formula is by playing... Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex. Now, if I haven't made this clear enough, I love Crash Bandicoot. Since my country of origin had a thing against Nintendo, I was primarily a PlayStation kid. But I didn't mind that at all since I got to enjoy the awesome Crash Bandicoot trilogy. Eventually, Iron Duck moved over to other games, and the development of the next Crash game was handled by Traveler's Tales. And they made some good games and some. Not so good. This is a chance for a brand new developer to insert their own flair into a classic franchise. But then you hear this. This is a theme song for Crash Bandicoot Warped, and it's the third time it's been reused if you also include Crash Bash. I know some people don't want to include it, but eh, someone needs to. The plot revolves Cortex and his henchmen moping around how they cannot defeat Crash Bandicoot until the alleged doctor brings up that he has a secret weapon that needs a power source. Uka Uka, in turn, brings up the elementals, nature-based mass that once wrought disaster upon the wall. And it's once again up to Crash and Coco to stop the threat once more. While I do admit the plot of the game is rather generic, I will give it one credit though. Making Cortex a secret weapon a rival Bandicoot named Crunch is a pretty awesome concept. The idea that this is what Crash would have become had he gone through the entire experiment in the original game is kind of fascinating, so it's nice to see Crash finally meeting his match. A lot of people have brought up how the character models in the game are severely lacking compared to the PS1 games, and I do have to agree, but an even bigger issue is the animation. Despite the technical limitations, the original PS1 games were very lively with their lip animations and general gestures, but here all the previously loony characters just sit around and do nothing. There's a small bit in which Cortex hits engine by mistake and there is no reaction from the latter, making this game lacking the cartoony energy of yore. And even though Crash is the best animator in the whole game, compared to all of his goofy reactions and death animations, it's definitely a far cry. But the game definitely makes up for it when it comes to voice talent, and there is a lot of it. I mean, Clancy Brown alone is worth the price of admission. Get ready to face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot! <laughs> But beside him and the rest of the cast that does a pretty good job with what they have, apparently Traveler's Tales managed to get a lot of big names to voice the elemental masks. We're talking the likes of Thomas F. Wilson, Arlie Ermy, Mark Hamill, and even Crash's current voice Jess Harnell. However, their presence here just serves as pure fan service. In most instances, they just reenact their old roles so they don't seem like fully-fledged characters. What are you looking at, fuzzhead? Leave my levels alone! It looks flammable! Ooh, I have some pussy! Okay, that last one wasn't real, but you should still watch Animaniacs. Despite my animation quibbles, I do have to say that Wrath of Cortex looks really nice. The different locations are colorful and varied, and I do love some of the new particle effects. But what most surprised me is the frame rate. I've never expected to play a Crash Bandicoot game back in the day that will move in 60 frames per second. And this is the kind of graphical jump I wanted to see from the PlayStation 1 days, so good on you, Traveler's Tales. Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex is the first multi-platform game in the series. It's pretty fascinating that there is an 11-month gap between the releases of the PS2 version to the GameCube 1. And while you think that all this extra development time will make this version the most refined, well, in naturality, it's probably the worst. There are many instances in which the levels seem to have a different color for no apparent reason. And for some, levels that were almost entirely engulfed in darkness are now strangely lit. But at least you can see box outlines, so it's not a complete failing grade. But the worst offense of the GameCube version is by far the frame rate. 
it barely stays at 60 frames per second and often drops to a lowly 30. I guess I should point out that the GameCube version does feature a GBA Link exclusive minigame called Crash Blast, in which you use a fruit bazooka in a shooting gallery, but it isn't worth the graphical downgrade. As for the PS2 version, if you can get past the loading times, which granted can last up until 30 seconds, it's not half bad. Though I do think the draw distance could have been better, especially since the horizon always appears to be <laughs> blurrier. So by far the best version is the Xbox. It has the best visual fidelity. I mean, come on, just look at this fur. And it also looks the sharpest thanks to the fact it's the only version that actually runs in progressive resolution. 480p to be exact. At its core, Wrath of Cortex is the same good old corridor platformer we remember. Run, smash boxes, get jewels, the works. There are five main hub sections with five levels each, and at the end of each of those, there is a boss fight. Pretty standard stuff. One of the biggest complaints is that Wrath of Cortex plays things a little bit too safe. I don't necessarily think that's the issue. In fact, this game is at its best when it just sticks the classic Crash Bandicoot platforming formula. The controls in this game feel really spot on. Even though they do feel a bit floatier as Crash seems to careen a bit higher than usual, but that only means that you can make your target more easily, which is always a good thing. There are only two noticeable downgrades I can think of, one being the hanging controls, which for some reason have been slowed down insurmountably, and the other being the Aku Aku invincibility, which lasts for a much shorter time, and additionally doesn't increase Crash's regular running speed. I have no idea why they made those changes, but they're not really game-breaking, so I find them just a nuisance at the most. This game also marks the first time Coco was actually playable in a platforming level, and while I was kinda sad to see her being a gimped version of her brother, I mean, seriously, that's supposed to be a kick? Her simplified gameplay kinda reminded me a lot of Crash Bandicoot 1, but with far better controls. Even her equivalent of the belly flop looks like she's doing a dropkick like she came straight from the Matrix. Unfortunately, I do have some issues with the level design. While levels are wider, they also feel a lot emptier, making many sections of them feel rather sparse. Not to mention that sneaking past enemies is much easier since their attack radius is far more limited. It just equates the game to some unnecessary filler. Do we really need this platform in level 21 and move slower than molasses? Really? I enjoy the platforming challenges in this game, especially the ones you get to partake in the death routes and gem routes. This could have been the ultimate vehicle for Crash Bandicoot to go into the next generation. But just how I shoehorn the war vehicle into the last sentence, let's talk about the shoehorn vehicle segments in this game. I do believe that Traveler's Tales went a bit bonkers with vehicles in this game. In fact, more than half of this game is comprised of those segments that feel forced upon the player, and each one has their own unique control scheme. It's not that all the vehicles control poorly, it's the fact it makes the game lose its identity as a platformer. Besides the obvious culprits like jeep riding and plane flying, there are also vehicles that just show up and never appear ever again. A good example is the trolley in level 22, Gold Rush. I just don't get the point where level 5 introduced a pretty fun mechanic with the minecart, why introduce a whole new gameplay mechanic when they had a perfectly adequate one to begin with? Another pointless element is the flying bug in level 9. Instead of using the rapid fire from the other plane levels, you're stuck with those homing missiles that lock on very slowly, which makes it a huge detriment compared to the other flying levels. I did like some moments, like when Coco is trying to escape a tsunami with a scooter. I just wish the game had more moments like that. She also gets a snowboard, which is pretty cool, but if you miss a box during those segments, you have to repeat the whole level again, and it's really tedious, but at least it controls better than the Jeep. I don't want to talk about the Jeep. There is also the underwhelming return of the underwater levels, which makes me soil my underpants. While the scuba diving part is fine, the Beatles reference here is atrocious. Not only it moves far slower, but unlike the sea bike from Warped, it only has a single hit point. That makes it even worse because booby traps are abundant here, and the bulky submarine is susceptible to blind attacks. 
on the other side of the spectrum of vehicle level that I actually enjoyed was the hamster ball. Those levels take an isometric view, and it's your job to navigate a maze while floating around at the speed of sound. While those levels tend to be fraught with nitro boxes, at the very least they provide a decent challenge, and it's pretty fun to speedrun them. But the award for the worst vehicle in the game is by far the mech suit. Now I know you might think this is heresy because this is a mech suit, and even a direct homage to the power loader from the Alien series. Heck. It's even touted at the front of the box. So what went wrong? For one, the only way to properly jump with it is while you're in motion. When you're standing still, it takes Crash a while to ascend from the ground because of his delayed animation. And when it comes to reacting in a split-second manner in platforming sections, it becomes downright atrocious. Two, aiming with it is a chore since it takes forever to line your crosser where you want to shoot, and the controls are just incredibly clunky. Especially when you try to line a shot in a 2D segment. 3, which is definitely the worst aspect, it goes down in one measly hit just like the submarine. It boggles my mind that this is supposed to be a powerful mech suit and it turns out to be the wimpiest of them all. It's probably why level 17 droid void is my least favorite because of all the focus on the mech suit, but at least level 24 has a cool chase sequence with the mech, but... Sadly, the damage has already been done. I respect immensely how much Traveler's Tales was trying to make each individual level stand out, but all those gameplay shifts are just jarring. I don't recall anyone complaining the original Crash Bandicoot trilogy that a theme was repeated one too many times because at least things were consistent. The developers were able to maximize the potential of each individual level because there was a consistent formula and it was incredibly fun. Here, mechanics come and go to flick of a switch, and nothing is truly fleshed out. Variety for the sake of variety is just trite. I mean, the game has so many great ideas, I just wish the... Uh, w wait, what is Tiny Tiger doing in the middle of a level? And why is he now a measly obstacle that just casually blocks my path? And Dingle Down and Entropy are here too? But, well, I, I saw you guys in the intro cinematic. Aren't you guys the bosses in the g Oh, no! Yes, in another asinine decision of this game, all the bosses that you know and love have been relegated to the sidelines in favor of Crunch using a different elemental mask every time. It doesn't matter if Biff or the Joker are provoking me, at the end of the day I know that Crunch is gonna be the next boss, so that completely ruins the element of surprise. The first boss is easily the worst. You have to turn all the rocks blue in order to hit Crunch. However, if he gets them first, they turn orange, and the only way to revert them back is either to wait, which isn't fun, or hit them, which hurts you back. Also, the fact that Crunch can change direction on his free will regardless of physics doesn't do the boss any favors. The other bosses aren't worth anything to write home about. The second one is a poor man's entropy. The third one, while interesting, is still just a back and forth chase with Crunch. And the fourth boss tries to recreate the engine battle from the last game, but it feels just lifeless and sterile, not to mention it just moves so slow. The final boss is probably the best, though in reality it's just still kind of serviceable. I like how this battle being a culmination of all the elemental masks being used together, as well as this as being the only instance when the bazooka is actually required. This fight also gets extra points that whenever you hit Crunch, he goes into a tired and straight uppercut's cortex. So you get Speaking of the bazooka, the power-ups are back in this game as well, only that you have to reclaim them after defeating a boss. Let's get the most obvious problem right off the bat. What the hell are the sneak shoes? Sneak along suspended nitro crates? Really? The only new power-up in this game is a completely situational one you're gonna use in some of the bonus levels. I don't even get this logic, how is tiptoeing on those boxes supposed to not set them off? And the moment you get the bazooka, this power-up is rendered moot. In the green gem route in the final level, you have to walk on a string of nitro crates once again. But a single shot of the bazooka clears them out, and you can just jump that gap with a double jump and a death tornado spin. What makes the inclusion of the sneak shoes even more interesting is the fact it comes in place of the super belly flop. But you can still earn this power up, it's just hidden at the end of the red jam path in Banzai Bonsai. 
and that gem can only be acquired in level 21, which is in the final hub world. So it's more of a nitpick, but I have no idea why the Super Belly Flop can only be acquired that late in the game. This is usually the part of the video in which I talk about sound, and when it comes to sound effects, it's not exactly my forte. But I do want to bring out one of the most glaring issues of the GameCube version, the sound mixing, especially in the plain levels. And why? <sighs> Brace yourself. Sorry about that one, guys, but before you regret having ears, I do have to say this. The soundtrack of this game is absolutely excellent. This might be my favorite soundtrack of the entire series, only rivaled by Crash Bandicoot 2. While Josh Mansell did not return to compose the soundtrack, Traveler's Tales' composer did a fantastic job, especially due to the fact that every single level has an original track, which surprisingly, almost every single one is a hit. I believe the reason why I love this soundtrack so much is because of its melodic focus, as opposed to the more atmospheric soundtrack of the past games. And you bet I'm gonna highlight some of my favorite tracks. Gold Rush is a perfect example. It starts off pretty slow and chill, but then it gets really intense. And I just adore the combination of both the piano and the different percussion instruments. Now, I'm not a music major by any stretch of the imagination, but I also love the track Wizards and Lizards because it uses a lot of brass. And oh boy, that brass is amazing. But not every single track has to be energetic and bouncy. A good example is Fahrenheit Frenzy, which starts with this awesome metal pipes banging sound that just sends shivers down my spine. And yeah, sometimes the music doesn't fit the mood. I mean, with a level like Avalanche, you expect something very intense, and then you get something like this. What's kind of weird about the music is that the level Medieval Madness has an original track in the PS2 version, but in the GameCube and the Xbox versions, the theme from the level The Gauntlet plays again. Now, usually I would mind it, but <laughs> The Gauntlet is one of the best tracks in the whole game. I just adore it. One! Three, four, five, the Vikings drink some beer. And when you tell a dirty joke, everyone will cheer. Hooray! Perhaps even too much. Like its predecessor, Wrath of Cortex also has gems and relics to collect, in addition to the generic crystals. But there are also relics that can be acquired if you finish a level fast enough. And I do admit that speedrunning this game can actually be pretty fun. Collecting those relics will grant you access to the final hub world, in which you can play bonus levels for every 5 relics you collect. Sadly, they feel more like mini-games than full-fledged levels. For example, the level Nighttime... I see what you did there, Traveler's Tales! That's my territory, back off! It's pretty much a darker version of the Gauntlet. But they're not necessarily bad, and I do like the fact you're getting a reward for your hard-earned effort. I just wish there was more to them. After collecting everything, you can beat Cortex for the second time and experience the true ending. Crunch is officially out of his mind control and decides to join the Bandicoots, and Cortex cowardly run away from Uka Uka on an iceberg that will probably lead to the intro of Crash Twin Sanity. I have never played it, but let's save something for next time. And that's the Wrath of Cortex, and I have no idea what this credit sequence is at all, so let's just move on to the final cut. On the positive side, the game controls extremely well. 
It's nice to have a 60 frame per second Crash Bandicoot game, even if it's not consistent on the GameCube version. And the soundtrack is definitely one of the best in the series. On the negative side, too many vehicles, too little platforming. While some levels can be fun, others can range from just mediocre to downright bad. And the technical issues of the GameCube version combined with the loading times on the PS2 versions makes them kind of frustrating. I'll stick with the Xbox version. So is Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex as bad as people made it out to be? No, not really. Granted, some levels truly frustrated me, but then again, the original trilogy also had its fair share of bad levels. My biggest gripe is that I wish that Traveler's Tales focused more on the platforming than all those random side activities that just detract from the main experience. The vehicle segments were never the focus in the original trilogy. They serve as a break from the platforming challenges. And this is why I love Crash Bandicoot 2 so much. After dealing with a hard level when there is nothing more fun than just using a jet ski or riding a polar bear to alleviate the stress. Also, I just realized, of all the vehicle segments they could have adapted, why are there no animal riding levels? Heck, Pura the Tiger is in the cutscene, why can I not ride? And I do believe that because of the lukewarm response to that game is why we didn't see the classic Crash Bandicoot formula come back to any game ever since. And frankly, that's pretty sad because I still enjoy it. Granted, it's pretty redundant to go to five different levels and face a boss, rinse and repeat, but... As long as the level design is good and the gameplay is tight, I'll have a blast. That's why I enjoy the Insane Trilogy so much. But that being said, if you want your Crash Bandicoot fix, I actually recommend this game. You might be pleasantly surprised and it is pretty cheap. But if I am 100% honest, I played through three versions of this game and all I want to do right now is simply crash.